Uh, so I do not have a chair's report today. We do have some minutes on the table. We have the November 17th workshop minutes. We have the 19th regular session minutes. Did anybody have any no discussion on those minutes? Okay, no. so we'll approve those minutes for November 17th workshop and November 19th regular session. There are some warrants on the table. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Are there any line item transfers? Ms. No. Okay. And we're up to the superintendent's report. Yes, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. We're looking forward to um, some of our final presentations around the proposed budgets from the department heads as well as uh, the school principals. We have one more budget that will be uh, presented at the next meeting, uh, which is the athletic budget, and also the superintendent. I'll be making the recommended uh, uh, budget, uh, the first entire uh, package to the school committee at that time. And that uh, meeting, of course, is scheduled on the 17th, two weeks from tonight, and it'll be at the Paseo School in room uh, uh, 13, I guess, is where yep. it is. But I also want to make sure that everyone's aware that we have, um, it is the season, we had a delightful uh, tree lighting ceremony and uh, the, at the high school, the vocal concert is scheduled for December 9th and the instrumental concert uh, for December 11th, and both of those, I believe, are at seven o'clock, aren't they? Mr. Spadafino, thanks. Um, we've received a thank you from uh, the Lunenburg Best Buddies chapter, uh, just thanking us for inviting them uh, to present at the school committee, and so I'll pass that out for the committee uh, to review. I also wanted to make the committee aware that um, at the primary school, the Giving Tree is um, is there in the atrium, and uh, the students down there are collecting donations of hats and mittens uh, from uh, students in the school, which will then uh, be provided to, to uh, individuals that can benefit from those. And also, the Big Sips and Little Sips program is a community service program. I think everybody Everybody's aware that pairs Lunenburg High School peer leaders with Turkey Hill Middle School students. And the students in the program have decided to coordinate a coat drive for their winter community service project. Uh, they'll, they place some boxes in the lobbies at the Lunenburg High School as well as the middle school and the primary school. And they'll be picking up contributions as needed through the next few weeks. All contributions are appreciated. They're asking for gently used or new coats for children. Um, those are especially needed and uh, on behalf of, of this group that is coordinated by Ms. Cavioli at the high school and Ms. Okerman at the middle school and the Big Sib, Lil Sibs program, uh, they thank you in, in advance for any support that you might be able to provide. I also, um, if you follow us on Facebook, you know that uh, there were uh, lots of events, important community service, as well as student recognition, uh, as well as social studies kinds of events, uh, but all with a, a little bit of fun mixed in with them um, that took place the half day before the Thanksgiving break. And um, I wanted to acknowledge at the high school uh, the uh, scholars there that were recognized during that uh, particular assembly at the school. Uh, AP scholar status is granted to students who receive scores of three or higher on three or more of the AP exams in this uh, past year. Jake DeGrace, Jacob Fager, Thomas Flaherty, Alex Fluet, Nathan Hollis, Jason Rowley, Caitlin Ruggiero, Shelby Scorsi and Jacqueline Smith were all recognized uh, for three on higher or three on more exams. There's also recognition that's provided to AB scholars uh, who have an average of at least 3.25 on AP exam. Um, uh, on four or more of those exams is the next uh, incremental up. And Jason Booth uh, received that recognition. And finally, there's also a recognition for AP scholars with distinction is this status. It's granted to students who receive an average score of at least 3.5 on all AP exams, a score of three or higher on five or more 
of the exams. And uh, Nathan Dindler uh, was an uh, AP scholar with distinction based upon his performance last year. National Merit commended students this year uh, score in, uh, there in the top 34,000 of the approximately 1.5 million who took the PSAT last year. Nathan Hollis and Thomas Flaherty received the, a commended status on that. And the National Merit semifinalists, and you have to be in the top 16,000 of the 1.5 million that take the PSAT. And Caitlin Ruggiero was, uh, received that award. So congratulations to those um, academic scholars at Lunenburg High School. They always make us very proud with their performance, and we know they work hard uh, to have those achievements. Uh, we also are aware that 34 students at Lunenburg High School this year received Adams scholarships uh, through, and that's a combination of their ranking in class as well as their performance on the MCAS, and that's, of course, an award that can be put towards a state institution that students go to towards tuition. So congratulations and um, uh, to all those learners. So we have a very full agenda, and that's my superintendent's report. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Mr. Mackin, would you like to provide a school building committee report? <coughs> Certainly. <clears throat> Again, we met today uh, as the um, construction team. Uh, the work continues on schedule. Um, we are 95% done with the foundation work. Uh, we expect that the delivery of the steel will happen next Monday the 8th, at which time they'll immediately begin putting the steel up. Uh, within the space of a day or two, you should actually see the building, <laughs> you know, that start starting to go up. Um, and um, they'll then continue to complete that perimeter of the foundation, and they're going, the way the steel will be erected is, um, as I described before, they, they build the, the building counterclockwise from the high school wing to the um, uh, middle school wing. And so the, the structure will... Uh, uh, be built in in that fashion. They'll go from from the high school wing to the core, to the gym, to the middle school wing, um, and um, basically the the way the steel comes in, you'll it, it actually is two. You'll see the two floor height as it as it comes in. Um, obviously, there won't be a, a dividing line between the floors yet because that that will happen as we go along. Um, so uh, that'll be pretty exciting. Um, the next uh, really piece of exciting news is that uh, we, the, our um, construction management team, along with our um, uh, contractor at risk, is, uh, are going through the final uh, bid uh, numbers. And we expect to hear by Friday what those uh, numbers look like, at which point they'll be transmitted to the school building committee. Uh, for review and approval for a guaranteed maximum price con contract. Um, and if uh, all goes well, and uh, the, uh, the indications that we have from our construction manager is that uh, things are looking positive, then uh, we will uh, approve the uh, guaranteed maximum price at Wednesday, next Wednesday at our next uh, school building committee meeting. Um, that work will continue through the through the weather. Uh, we're assuming that the final girder, which will be part of the topping off ceremony, will happen in you know late February, uh, early March, and uh, you know at that point that will be a, a a point at which you know the the school community can can get involved in in what's a very traditional um, um, ceremony that the steel workers. Um, have used for 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 many years uh, the topping off ceremony. That's great. Any questions? For so so uh, again, there's been no uh, requests for change orders. There's been no uh, uh, change. Uh, we are still on time. We are still on budget. Um, on schedule. And we're still on schedule. Right. Excellent. It's great news. Okay, our new business, which we have a bunch of tonight, our calendar advisory report, part one. This was a two-part charge we gave. Um, and I'd like to, guess, invite the advisory committee to come up. Who's going to speak? Mr. Shapiro. Um, yeah, I was going to speak. Do we want them to 
It's up to them. It's up to you. How do you, how do you want to handle it? You want to be on Jimmy, TV? Your presentation and we'll take it. Okay, and then you guys can comment if you. Okay. Um, well, first, I will just um, thank everyone who was on the committee, um, which was um, myself, Heather Schroka, um, Amy Powers, um, Amanda Waltz, Brandon Kibbe, Louis Betancourt, Katie McGuire, Dr. Gary Asher, and Ron Hyatt was our LHS um, student representative. So we had um, very thoughtful and productive discussions um, regarding the first part of our charge, which was to make recommendations on the school calendar um, regarding vacations, a start and end date, and start and end, uh, no, start and end times we're going to do later. That's part two. So, yes, that's part two. Part one is just the calendar for next year. So we have a draft calendar that we're presenting to the school committee um, to look at. It's just a recommended, suggested calendar for the way the committee thought um, next year should be set up. Um, so the school committee will look at that um, alongside the calendar that they will get from the internal, um, the faculty calendar committee, and we'll have discussion regarding that in January. Um, when we look at the two calendars. So do you want me to go over a little bit about it or not? What would you like to do? Why don't you tell us some of the high points of okay. what you're recommending, if there are any changes so from our current for, plans? Okay, for, so our first goal in next year's calendar was relative to the summer of 2016, which is the fantastically busy summer where we will vacate the current high school and move into the new building. So with that in mind, we approached next year's calendar trying to have an end of year date that was as early in June as possible to allow time for um, everyone to get out of um, the old building. Um, so we sort of picked a date in June, which I think was June 10th, I think, if I can find it here. Um, so that then when we added on our five snow days, that would bring us to, you know, the end of the third week, which would still give two weeks to, you know, clear out. So with that in mind, we actually, um, uh, there were the, the things that are probably a significant change um, were prior to Labor Day, we had suggested that the students go to school four days, so that would be Tuesday through Friday, instead of the traditional Tuesday through um, Thursday that we've been doing with a four-day Labor Day weekend. So we're suggesting a three-day Labor Day weekend with the students having four days um, and the teachers having two PD days prior um, to that, so Friday and Monday, however that would shake out. Um, so that was the one change um, there. Um, I think everything else, Columbus Day remained the same. Veterans Day um, was on a Wednesday, so we're just suggesting that that just be the Wednesday holiday without a you know, professional development day on either side of it. Um, so we were suggesting the two professional development days at the beginning of the year and the third one, rather than coming with one of the holiday weekends or something during the year, we had proposed it be the, after the last day of students being in the building. So that would give the staff a, you know, that last professional development day after the students are done. So we do not have another PD day suggested within that 180 student days. So that was a change. So Columbus Day and Veterans Day, Thanksgiving break um, are pretty typical. Winter break, um, the holiday falls on Friday. Um, Christmas is on a Friday next year. So we had suggested going to school right till the 23rd with the break starting on the 24th and then returning to school on January 4th because, of course, New Year's is on a Friday. Um, so that's a little bit shorter, but pretty typical, I think, of what has been done in the past when the holiday is later in the week. Um, so the biggest change is probably the um, February break. Um, we have proposed a four-day weekend um, with that Washington holiday with um, having Monday and Tuesday off 
and then going to school the other three days. Um, in the interest of getting out early and as we'll discuss a little bit when we come up with, when we discuss the guidelines we came up with, um, sort of in the interest of when we have snow days and the students seem to be out of school a lot in that January and February and going into early March period, um, there was some thought that perhaps we shouldn't have as many scheduled days off um, at that point. April break is just like typical, the week of Patriots Day, a full week. Memorial Day was typical. And then we would get out the last day for students on the proposed calendar without snow days would be June 7th, and then the teachers would have a um, PD day on June 8th. And so that would get pushed out to the um, 14th if we had the five snow days. So that's just in a nutshell, which is probably hard for people to figure out without seeing it. But just a, a few changes, but pretty, not, not, not alarming, I don't think. Um, so that again is just a recommendation from the calendar advisory to the school committee. It's not what the calendar will be. We will determine that after we, you know, look at the other one. So while we had all of this discussion, um, some of was, which was driven by our survey, which we spent a good amount of time putting together a survey and getting that out, we had, you know, great response from the community, the faculty, parents. Um, all of the students at the high school took the survey in their homerooms. Um, and we had our three questions were um, related to whether or not going to, returning to school before, before or after Labor Day. Um, uh, and ex if people prefer an extended winter break, uh, holiday break, or not. And of course, that one's kind of tricky because a lot of that is really dependent on when the holidays fall. You know, so that one kind of, I think, changes year to year. But, you know, we did ask the question of whether people preferred that longer break or not. And then the other question was if people would prefer the two, the traditional two um, February and April break or to go to one March break. And all of our results will be posted online. They really came back pretty, um, pretty much a dead heat on all of the questions. Um, whether, you know, there, there wasn't really much swing one way or the other. Um, except with the students, the student results um, very clearly indicated that they like things the way they are. They like to return to school before Labor Day. They like an extended holiday break and they like the two breaks. That was really pretty, pretty clear and those results will be um, posted as well. So we just, we also had an enormous amount of written comments. I think about a third of the people who took our survey actually, you know, commented, which was fantastic. We used a lot of that in our discussion. And there were many comments related to um, the start and end times, which um, is our discussion that we're going to go into following, you know, in the next couple of months. And we'll report back to the school committee in March on that. So we're gonna, we'll go right back to those comments when we um, get into looking at the start and end times as well. So I wanted to thank everyone for um, their input and taking the time to do that. So while we were putting together the calendar for next year and looking at these results and having discussion, we just took a stab at coming up with some sort of basic guidelines, which are up there. I don't know if you guys, where well, they were? Yeah, they'll be back. They will be. There you go. <laughs> um, just some, some basic guidelines that could, could be looked at uh, when making the calendar, you know, each year. Um, so we're taking into consideration some, some pretty basic principles, the 180 days of school for the students, um, the 183 days that's in the teacher contract. We have to account for five snow days, but we wanted to make it clear because it appears that there, you know, it's a little confusing that even though we add five snow days onto the calendar, the students are required to make up however many snow days we have, not just five, as long as we get out of school by June 30th. You know, I, we gathered that there was some confusion. Some people thought that if we had seven snow days, we really only had to make up five because the calendar only accounted for five. 
so we were, you know, trying to put clear that up a little bit. Um, but and to, just to clarify, the June thirtieth date. We will have 180 days before June 30th. Yes. Right. Whether we go to school Saturday and Sunday, if right. we, whatever we have right. to do. Right, because we have to be done by right. June so 30th. It's a state. That's right. on there. That's okay. Yeah, so we have that on there that it can't go That's past June guideline. 30th. Right. That's a law. Yeah. So we were, ta right, we were taking these, Those were not the guidelines. Top. These are the current facts, the principles that have to have be to considered. Be, yeah. Yeah. when you make the calendar and then below it are the guidelines right and so but our the number five for the principles was what our just to you know give what, what our main goal was in looking at this was to figure out how you could approach the calendar and maintain as many full five-day weeks for the students as possible like looking at maximizing uh, the continuity of instruction so that's that's where we were coming from in these guidelines. So then these are the suggestions, um, that school should start the week before Labor Day um, and be comprised of a minimum of a three-day week. This year we had the two-day week, and you know we, we thought that maybe that wasn't, um, I think that you know, the three days would be better. Um, as I said, next year we, we sort of veered from our suggestions next year but that was relative to trying to get out early we um so the suggestion is that you go at least three days um which would still allow for um, the two days of professional development which we had understood the staff enjoyed you know having those two days and found it useful to have those two back-to-back -back days to kick off the year um so it would still allow for that all of the you know um, observed days would be the same, Labor Day, Columbus Day, Veterans Day, all of those throughout the year. Um, we did suggest that when possible, the um, third professional development day come the Tuesday after Columbus Day. Um, there was a lot of discussion. I think the committee, the reason um, it was suggested to be Tuesday rather than doing a Friday, Monday, is because it allows for a five-day week and then a three-day week, and there was a thought that that was um, beneficial um, to the students in the classroom. Um, Thanksgiving break, uh, you know, suggested is remains the same. Um, winter vacation, um, the recommendation is that it be December 24th through January 1st, of course, dependent upon how the calendar, you know, suits that. Um, there is a suggestion that February break um, be shortened to be that four-day holiday weekend and uh, I think largely the reason for that was to keep kids in school when we have those snow days as I said before um, that kind of breaks things up um, and then April vacation would to remain the same so can I um, ask one question about the February break one of the things and this is an anecdote right one of the things I've noticed over the years my kids were in school is that between at following the winter break um, kids start to get sick and usually come the end of january there's a very large fraction of kids that are sick and as we get closer to the to the february vacation um, attendance falls off and then people go away for a week the school gets clean from top to bottom and the attendance rate uh, due to people being out sick goes back up. Did you guys address yep. the three-day week with the... Dr. The, Asher. With the we school did, nurses? Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, with the school nurses who actually deal with this? Oh, no. No, we did not... Dr. Asher, keep in mind, it was a gerontologist. He's not really... He was a GP, but his practice was mostly old people. We did, we <laughs> did bring it up, though. Right, so yeah, it, we it had a lot of discussion that about nurses. that, but we did not talk to the school nurses about it. I suggest um, you go back and ask. Um... Because really, if we've only got the one day to clean the school, because uh, we, right, because the rest is a holiday, right? Then I'm not sure that we'll have the same impact on the the uh, contagious nature of the building. But that's that seems to me to have been a, a real thing for a few years. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Come on. He's on the committee. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Brandon Kibbe, 146 Rolling Acres Road. Uh, uh, Dr. Asher did address that, and you know, his I, I went to him as a family practitioner. I'm sure. 
certainly not uh, in that category. Um, <laughs> as did I, and I'm not as thinking myself as old either. <laughs> as, as, as <laughs> And, and, and the way he described it is he said, you know, we principally that's a, a flu outbreak. And he described it really as uh, uh, that is that anecdote that you described is more of uh, a myth than it is a reality in that the, sure. the, that most of those outbreaks are flu driven and nobody knows when the flu is going to hit. So my suggestion, and, though, is uh, Dr. Asher is a great guy. I've known him since I was 10. He was my doctor too. Um, <laughs> but the school nurses are the ones who are in there keeping track of who's, who's out sick and who's not out sick. And they have the data for our district and our population in our climate. And um, I think it would behoove us to, to get their input I think on this. I think that's smart. Before making medical decisions without contacting our own and, medical uh, And, and uh, we obviously uh, relied on Dr. Asher as Right. a medical representative so uh, and one of his his point was that you know the, the flu season can start anytime it sure. can start now, now yeah. and in, in the outbreak and he's and you know he, yeah. he gave the example of recently the flu outbreak that was causing a lot of absences was broken by April mm -hmm. vacation right. um, not necessarily February vacation so you can't you can't predict when that's going to happen uh, let's so. look at the data Thanks. Um, I don't think I don't think I have anything else. I think we, we went over, you know, pretty much that's what we did. These guidelines were just something to start with. Um, I think talking to the nurses is a great idea. It's again the snow days. If we don't have any snow days. And we only have, you know, the flip side of this, if we don't have any snow days and we only have that one extra day off in February, that's a long haul from January to April, April break right. with one day off. You know, everybody knows March is a long month and it's full of MCAS and all kinds of things. So, you know, there, there certainly are things that we can't predict such as flu outbreaks and snow days. So, I'll, I'll take know. the odds on not having snow days over Powerball any day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, you know, I think that that was our thought that generally there are some days off and the more we can plan for the kids to be in school, right. you know, the, the better um, that would be. But this is not as a, the, my personally, not as a committee member here. I, I do, um, I know a few times in the past we have added in that day or whatever in March to give at least a three-day weekend in March, I do think it really should be considered if we do go with that shortened break that we do look at that one extra day in March just to give people a little bit of time to refresh. Um, but that's just me personally, not the committee saying that. Is it, you know, it's not one of the guidelines. But that, that would be the concern I have about that. So I don't know if anybody else on the committee wants to comment. Do you want to comment? Oh, I just wondered if Brandon, Brandon wanted to say anything about this, the, the survey results, because you took the numbers apart. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think the survey re results, when you looked at them in aggregate, didn't really tell a, a very strong story. Uh, you know, so, but one of the things we had in there was a way for people to identify themselves as a parent as a faculty, teacher member, student, other community member. Uh, most of the responses were parents and outside of the entire high school <laughs> taking the survey um, were, were parents and uh, uh, faculty teachers. Uh, and uh, I think what you saw across the board across those three questions was basically um, parents were even split. I think. Uh, faculty was pretty much status quo is what is what they were looking for the only major difference there had to do with the February school vacation and it was pretty heavily in favor of dropping the two to two vacation scenario by the parents it's like 70 something percent so uh, that was interesting uh, when you started doing and and I had uh, uh, did some research about other communities. We're not the only community having this conversation right now. There's communities all over the Commonwealth, in fact, all over New England, where this is a sort of a unique situation. Most of the country uh, has a single March break. 
uh, we are different, we have MCAS, so we have to uh, live in that realm. And there was a lot of feedback in the survey about the impact on MCAS. If you were to break up that busy MCAS month with a March break instead of a February, April break. So we said, we, that's, that's reasonable. <laughs> it's a reasonable thing to respond to. And that's why we, we chose the April break to maintain that as an adequate break between understanding there's scattered snow, snow days and a long weekend built in along with other holidays, Martin Luther King Day uh, among them. So uh, there's, uh, uh, the survey really did, that was the only major sort of difference in the survey data was pertaining to school break. Uh, I mentioned the other communities because those other communities also did surveys and so when you start googling that research it's pretty clear uh, in each of those communities very strong support for dropping the february break so it's not just a discussion that's happening here in lunenburg with lunenburg parents it's happening all over the place uh, so we're not alone uh, in having that conversation um, just the, to respond to that i think some of when we we looked at the calendars for a number of these other communities and if I remember correctly there were several that have had their calendars similar to what we're proposing with that um, sort of February long weekend yeah and the communities and, that and have made that change April break. And the communities that have made that change have made that change and tried it out and some communities have changed back and uh, it would be conjecture to determine why that is or without further research. We don't, ha we don't have that information. Um, but uh, the one point I wanted to underscore with the guidelines in particular, because it's the guidelines I think that make, um, make the most difference here. You know, the cal calendar is sort of what the calendar is, right? You can only fit 180 days between Labor Day and June 30th in so many different ways with all the required days off. So, um, you know, what we were, the, the, the number five there on the principles is the one that was really driving my own participation uh, in the discussion, which is the continuity of education. And uh, that's what matters the most to me, is, is uh, everything I've heard from teachers who teach and, and children who go to school is that whenever you, uh, that, uh, that uh, 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 having a, a predictable schedule is good and any change to that any deviation from your regular schedule is causes disruption and so that's why we looked at five full days as many five full day weeks as possible to minimize the weeks that are fractured so whether it be by a half day by a scheduled holiday by professional development days. If we're going to fracture a week, and we, well, let's fracture one week rather than two weeks. So that's why with the four-day weekend in February vacation, for instance, we said, instead of having it a Friday and a Monday, have it a Monday and a Tuesday. That way we have a five-day week before a three-day week, which is the fractured week, which will have disruption, and a followed by a five-full-day week where you can have good continuity of education. Again, the whole point of this is provide the best quality education that we can for the students. That's what was driving this whole conversation. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, my and the other committee members can, can uh, probably uh, admit to this as my own personal hunt was half days and full days. It's like I wanted to minimize as many of the half days as possible and maximize the number of full weeks as possible. So. And we did look at our half days and half days of um, the superintendent pulled together yeah. the half days of We're a number of surrounding yeah. and we are right at yep. the bottom. We're I mean, good. some I know, you know, top, depending on your communities were having 14 or 15 or the <laughs> right. top, yeah, yeah. top or bottom. We were at the lower number yeah. of half days. And when we looked at that, we realized that we really can't. There's no, nowhere else. We to really can't trim. cut our half days. We're only having them really when they need to be Where you know for, right for <laughs> conferences or the last day of school or, yeah. you know um professional development you know so when when we looked at other districts some that are having 14 or 15 um half day or early release because some of them differentiated 
you but know, that, yeah. but when you're looking at the guidelines, we have to place a half day for parent-teacher conferences. Right. So let's place that half day somewhere where it is already in a fractured week, rather than fracturing another week, is my point. And that's the point of the guideline, uh, is to try to place those in places that will have less impact. If we have to place another professional development day, place it in a place that doesn't fracture another week. Right, so that's that's important, but it's also important for us to schedule our PD to match the uh, our, our school improvement goals, and, and that we right. do defer to our administration. And we discussed that, that as well. And that's why it's a guideline. Right. Right. That there may be you know, reasons that a PD needs to be later in the year, or when exactly. a certain facilitator is available, or, you know. Right. Whatever is because they have necessary. a purpose, right? right? Another purpose right. that's also equally important for education. So right. we have to keep that in mind when we mm -hmm. put together the whole schedule. Right. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have comments? Okay. Any other feedback on the calendar? Okay. Great. We're up to the technology budget, Mr. Melandrino. Good evening. You should have uh, <clears throat> a copy of my FY16 operational budget uh, in front of you. Uh, you'll note it's a level funded budget from uh, last year. There are a few changes in line items, mostly uh, just shifting items around to be in their proper category. Uh, we had had some <clears throat> uh, instructional technologies and administrative technology lines and vice versa, so just shifting those around to be in the proper places. Uh, changed the numbers a little bit, but the bottom line uh, stayed the same. Uh, some of the uh, noteworthy changes, uh, we did come down on equipment maintenance and lease. That is our copiers throughout the buildings. Um, a little more accurately sized units uh, and placing them in the proper places allowed us a little bit of savings there. Um, Networking contracted services uh, basically just consists of the final payment on the uh, Wi-Fi system for the primary school uh, and also a new VPN solution that we're implementing next year or looking to implement next year. Uh, under instructional technologies, uh, you'll see that 6200, which is a bit lower than last year, we're actually only picking up um, some access points for the middle school uh, to fill in some dead spots there. <clears throat> wireless access points, that is. Uh, we've got some rooms in the corners that are having uh, limited access, and we've been putting some other solutions in place, but they're uh, not ideal. So getting some actual access points that match our system will um, solve that. Uh, and everything else is pretty straightforward, um, almost just a copy of last year. So any questions on that stuff? Any questions? Concerns? Okay, a 0% increase, that's great. We like that. Yeah. <laughs> that was by design. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you should also have a copy of the 10-year uh, plan that I put together. Uh, <clears throat> it'll probably make a little more sense after the presentation that we're about to give. Uh, but basically, it consists of large items uh, or items that aren't currently on the operational budget. Um, just to show uh, what kind of change there's going to be when the new high school comes online, uh, depending on how we go about facilitating the technology in that building. So we've got four options here. Um, basically, which will be outlined in the presentation <coughs> to come. <clears throat> and again, it should make much more sense uh, after that. So. If there are any questions on it now, I'm glad to answer them. Uh, otherwise, we can go into the presentation. Uh, <coughs> Why don't we go into the presentation? I think that makes sense. All right. We can go back to that afterward. Sure. Um, so one of the things I want to point out, uh, uh, our title here uh, says it in terms of being a first draft, because we really do see this as a point of setting the stage for a, a discussion that needs to happen within our school community as well as the broader community. Uh, we have seen that uh, there's a great opportunity coming up. Uh, there's numerous opportunities coming with the, with the construction of the new middle school and high school. We've articulated many of those around staffing and curriculum 
Harlem and just a being in a building with the 21st uh, century that was built for education in the 21st century. But the technology infrastructure in the new building provides opportunities for advancing the use of instruction and learning technologies in our schools. The initial review of the budget with our IT consultant for the project, um, we have already determined that it's inadequate to provide a one-on-one -on -one commuting, computing environment for grades six through 12. The budget that is provided that um, is, is programmed for within a construction project uh, would not be able to meet the needs. So it would need to be supp supplemented if we went with a one-on-one -on -one environment as uh, particularly given which option, of course, we'll have to look at. But sustainability um, is, is a b very big important uh, piece of what we thought about when we put together this presentation. You know, setting up some sort of funding cliff uh, that we fall off of in three years or in four years um, or in two years um, is not a fiscally responsible thing to do. And so we've uh, talked to a lot of people who have uh, looked at this problem as they've constructed schools, some that saw uh, and adapted for it and others that uh, were hopeful that they would be able to manage it and later on finding that they weren't. Um, and we want to avoid those kinds of missteps uh, in order to maximize what happens in the building and make sure that it's sustained over time. So by narrowing the scope of the one-on-one -on -one program, uh, there's a couple ways to narrow that scope, and that's, uh, that's a decision, uh, that's an instructional decision for our students, it's a decision for this uh, school committee as we put together a uh, budget, and it's a, a statement of our core values as we work with the community in terms of how we want this building and what kinds of opportunities we want to make available to the students in it. Uh, but um, uh, one of our primary guiding lights throughout this process was to make sure that we were doing it in a fiscally responsible manner. The new building was designed for 21st century learning, as I said. It includes a really robust technology infrastructure, and Mr. Maladrinos will describe that in detail in some upcoming slides. The building has project rooms that we've talked about a lot that provide lar uh, space for both large and small group collaboration. The media center, as well as other areas around the building have specific spaces in them that have been designed and, uh, and uh, will be equipped to support students and teachers collaborating in smaller groups as well. And with that collaboration, the opportunity to collaborate using the technology is present within our environment and already. The use of uh, Google apps in, in our educational program, we have Google accounts for all of our su uh, students. Mrs. Valley just did a presentation and had a, a huge turnout uh, for a workshop that she gave recently uh, of using Google Educator. Um, and, and our educators are really embracing this and making a good use of those kinds of applications, um, uh, but it requires students to have some devices to further maximize it, especially if we're going to uh, do that not only during the school hours, but outside school hours. And we also have some survey data from the high school uh, that talks about the kinds of devices that students have at home um, and so are, are and could possibly bring into school. So that, those were all important pieces of information for us as we talked about um, this and, and making some proposals and, and showing the committee and the community some options that um, are available to us in terms of optimizing the opportunities that the building can bring. In the district, we continue to shift to an inquiry-based uh, classroom model where students are constructing knowledge instead of having teachers hand it to them uh, in some sort of lecture or other format. Um, that's, what in, uh, that's what education is about in, in the 21st century. The amount of information available to us and to our students uh, continues to explode, and uh, as does our access to that information, or at least for some, the access to that information continues to expand. And therein lies a key around equity for our students as well. 
um, what matters is not what students know anymore, but how they acquire the knowledge and the skills to do something with that information, and how they create new knowledge out of that information and they solve problems. More than ever before, education for the information age requires authentic learning and 21st century skills. I have to change. Technology in our schools. Where are we now, Mr. So this is kind of uh, the 10,000 foot view of uh, what we're doing right now uh, in the schools. Uh, so access to technology for students consists uh, primarily of uh, static computer labs and mobile technology carts. Uh, basically you have a cart with 30 iPads on it, you wheel it into a room, you pass them out to all the kids uh, and you go. Uh, or the uh, alternate choice of that is there are um, a couple of classrooms in each school that are loaded with 30 computers everybody sits down and and they start their lesson that way um, <clears throat> we over the past couple of years have unified the Wi-Fi systems throughout the schools so for um, staff and administrators if they move from school to school Wi-Fi stays the same they don't have to make any changes everything just works um, this is actually a corporate style Wi-Fi environment. It's not designed to have uh, every kid in the classroom on Wi-Fi at all times. Uh, it doesn't have the capacity for that currently. Uh, that was just out of reach um, financially. Uh, so we have fully virtualized our server environment across all the schools now. Uh, the physical servers are basically just hosts to uh, what are called virtual machines. <clears throat> Those can be moved and saved and shuffled around and easily backed up. Uh, so it's a big improvement. Um, on the infrastructure side. Centralized storage and management, I've talked about this stuff before. <clears throat> Basically just putting all the file stores and uh, all the management stuff in one place uh, at the high school where it is now uh, allows us to simplify the management, um, have everybody connect to the same devices, simplify backups, it makes things much easier. Uh, we've been conducting ongoing professional development. Um, one of the gentlemen that works for me, Josh, our network admin, uh, has been giving some classes on uh, basic laptop use, how to access files from home, how to deal with uh, viruses, things like that. Uh, and we also have plans in the works for some basic Word and Excel classes as well for um, staff and administrators, whoever wants to take them. We'll be providing those as well. Uh, we've focused quite a bit on reliability. Uh, with a small staff, we need to keep everything working uh, without constant intervention. Uh, so that's been one of our focuses, and I think it's been working out well. Our school dude numbers have actually been coming down over the past couple of years. School dude is a system we use for work requests. So if somebody's system goes down, they submit this request. We come and fix it, and they've been going down. We're down probably about 25% uh, over two years ago. <clears throat> and safety and security always um, top of mind, as they say. Uh, we've got some intelligent internet filtering. We use a... Uh, uh, DNS-based filtering, which is basically the internet phone book. It translates um, website addresses into IP addresses, and doing that on the outside of our network um, doesn't allow anyone inside our network to actually circumvent those controls. So there's no way to get from inside our network to sites outside our network that we don't want people getting to. Um, acceptable use policy is uh, currently in place. It's the same one from when it was implemented a couple of years ago, uh, that again will probably be, uh, um, definitely be updated as the new high school comes in, depending on how we uh, go about presenting technology to the students. Uh, and network monitoring, just something else I wanted to mention, is that we keep a constant eye on network traffic and what's flowing between buildings and what's coming through the internet and things like that. Uh, and we get alerts when things don't look right or are maybe um, students doing something they shouldn't be or things like that. So we get alerted ahead of time instead of having to sort of react to a problem after it happens. Uh, so to describe in a little more detail our current model of technology access for the students, um, carts and labs, the advantages of this, of maintaining this model going forward, there'd be no change in yearly cost for equipment. It's basically the same uh, stuff we're doing now. We'd just be pushing it forward into the new school. Uh, and again, no professional development or changes in methodology will be required as this, um, the teachers are already used to this model uh, and they know how to use it. Uh, so there wouldn't be much change there. 
Disadvantage is a little bit more numerous. <laughs> it's kind of a dated model. Um, lots and lots of districts are going into one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's going to be everywhere eventually. It's already everywhere in the business world. Um, we have limited use for uh, individual students. They maybe get two periods a day uh, where they have access to a laptop or an iPad or some device like that. <clears throat> we also have approximately 11% of students that don't have access to a device at home. Uh, those numbers came from a survey that was conducted in Turkey Hill Middle School with about 400 or so responses. So I think it's pretty statistically valid. Um, the, the cart model especially negatively impacts instruction time. Just wheeling the cart into the room, distributing the, the, the uh, laptops or iPads takes five minutes, ten minutes. That's a good chunk of a 50-minute period. Uh, and requirements for upcoming state assessments, we had uh, quite a time getting all the students in Turkey Hill Middle School to uh, take the most recent assessments that were um, at the end of the last school year. Um, putting devices in everyone's hands would certainly make that much easier. Uh, so in the design of the new building, um, what we wanted to do is get the infrastructure that we currently have in the carts. The Wi-Fi is built into the carts. The power is all built into the carts. We wanted to get that off of carts and integrated into every classroom, uh, which is how the Wi-Fi system is being designed in the new school. Uh, every student could have probably three devices online at the same time. I think the uh, infrastructure would handle that, but definitely two, um, a personal phone and maybe a laptop, uh, along with every teacher and administrator would be able to be online at once. We will be retaining dedicated labs uh, for the more high-end computing uses, such as graphics and CA uh, CAD and engineering. Um, and I just described the educational style Wi-Fi. That was sort of a point on the first line there. Our goal uh, in looking at this plan as well um, as what we've been trying to do with our technology as we've acquired it even up to uh, the current time is to integrate technology into our inquiry-based educational model. Uh, so technology is not the end in itself, it's a tool that we utilize. It provides that uh, constant access to information uh, that is so important and the tools uh, is a, an integral tool, I think, in terms of making this learning experience for our students um, be as authentic as possible. It helps prepare our students uh, for what their next steps will be in some kind of post-secondary educational model, which we know is in everyone's future. Uh, it may be college, it may be some other kind of post-secondary training, but it, there will be secondary training. And if you've uh, watched uh, that scene develop out there, you know that online learning um, is is becoming more and more a part of what's happening on uh, college campuses um, and beyond college campuses for uh, for students. And we've talked uh, as we've looked at graduation requirements about foreseeing a time when uh, taking and you know some of our students do already take an online learning course, a virtual high school uh, course, where that will be, become a component that's required for graduation at some point in time because that's how the field is developing and those are the required skills in order to be successful and keep learning going. Technology, as we said before, is it, it can uh, really democratize a, a classroom. It, it really takes those limitations of out having access to information and opens up those doors. Uh, so, so students can begin to personalize their educational experiences. They can pursue those uh, personal interests, uh, which always adds values and increases engagement on the part of the students, um, as well as just providing that opportunity for kids to have access to things that otherwise they might not um, have access to in terms of the information. Um, you know, we all know the story about the books in the shelves in the library, and um, you need to get to the library, you need to find those books. Putting it online, having access to uh, that information online uh, really opens up many more opportunities to many more students. And uh, uh, the research around flip, flip classrooms, some of which our, our uh, teachers at the high school have uh, pursued and are uh, continuing to pursue, um, is some really 
really very exciting uh, kinds of information and data coming out of, uh, of what happens when you're able to provide students the opportunity uh, to not just read the book at home, but to see that lecture or to see that presentation um, online, to catch, uh, capture it there and then to come into class to do the real nuts and bolts of, of what learning is, is how do we, um, how do we interact with each other, how we make meaning, and how do we engage in the conversation. Um, uh, it, it was fascinating to me as we began to re research this topic in more detail to find out how many districts across the country had really looked at the use of technology in a one-on-one -on -one computing environment to level the playing field and to assist students who are uh, before are considered at risk in, in terms of opening up the instructional program to them and providing more opportunities and different kinds of opportunities for them to, to pursue knowledge and to, to acquire the information in, on topics that they're interested in and therefore develop the learning skills and, uh, that go along with that, which are the essential components of understanding is learning how to learn. How do you solve problems? How do you uh, talk about the kinds of uh, quality of the information? How do you assess the value of that information and how do you in integrate it? So those are some of the ways that um, there's uh, numerous studies out there that are documenting independently the level of engagements as well as uh, the amount of increased learning time that opens up in a one-on-one -on -one environment and provides uh, more opportunities to many of the students in order to achieve uh, the learning successes and higher levels of performance. So we have basically three options to present. Aside from uh, continuing the current model, <clears throat> uh, option A that we're calling in this presentation is a fully district funded one to one uh, for grades 10 through 12. Uh, we had to limit the scope to that just to keep the numbers um, reasonable and uh, avoid, as the superintendent said, falling off that financial cliff in three or four years. Uh, option B is a uh, bring your own device, but uh, with the device type being mandated by the district. And option C, another bring your own device, uh, allowing any portable device that the students currently own to be used. So option A <clears throat> is a uh, fully or partially funded one-to-one um, -one program uh, supplemented possibly by a technology fee, an annual technology fee. Um, the district would purchase uh, devices for the 10th grade class starting on the first year that the new school is open. Um, purchases for the 11th and 12th grade class would be made with building project funds. Um, <clears throat> that would be approximately $92,000 worth of the building project funds to purchase uh, devices for the two grades uh, and about $46,000 for the district to purchase for the 10th grade. Um, I did include some options with a tech fee ranging from zero to fifty dollars depending on uh, how we decide to go. Uh, those numbers are at the bottom of this slide. Um, insurance for each device uh, would be thirty dollars to be paid by the student. Uh, we can actually set up a portal with vendors that parents can go to, log into a website, uh, sign up for their insurance. Uh, they'd get the economy of scale of the fact that the whole district has this uh, program available and we could make it very easy for them and at the same time uh, keep ourselves from being the broker of these insurance policies. <clears throat> uh, we had discussed creating some community service or scholarship opportunities for students uh, around that insurance fee. Uh, and the bottom of the slide here just um, lists the annual uh, cost to the district for purchasing these dev devices uh, depending on whether or not we choose to implement a technology fee. Option B, the um, bring your own device uh, mandated by the district. Basically, we would require uh, parents to purchase a device. Um, the numbers that I've come up with so far indicate that $400 is a pretty reasonable price to get a uh, unit that will be uh, viable for at least three years. And the $30, again, is for the insurance policy. Again, we can create those community service and scholarship opportunities for students uh, to offset that cost. Um, there would still be some annual cost to the district uh, for devices provided to students at no cost. 
uh, for instance, free and reduced lunch students or students with IEPs. Um, the initial cost from the building funds on that would be 49000 and annually, uh, the district would have to um, fund about $18,000 worth of devices. <clears throat> and the last option is a uh, bring, bring your own device of any portable device uh, that the student currently owns. The big uh, cost in this uh, scenario is um, something called network access control. Uh, it'll be described a little bit later in the slide, but the additional infrastructure required uh, to maintain network security for a system like this uh, is about $60,000. We would actually need another full-time person to manage the fact that there are six or seven or eight different types of devices in use by students at all times. Uh, the level of expertise in all those devices, uh, it's, a, it's a daunting task to say the least, so we would certainly need another uh, full-time person to handle that. Um, and in the initial year, that's looking like approximately $164,000 uh, to get that system up and running. The annual cost there, um, we would still have to purchase devices for that subset of students. Uh, and along with the additional IT personnel, um, we're looking at an annual cost of approximately $73,000. So going with options A or B, uh, benefits and costs are about the same for those two options as we end up with uh, a homogenous environment of everybody having the same device. Um, students have access to the devices throughout the day and after school. Uh, there is instructional flexibility lended in the fact that everybody has the same device. Um, lesson plans are much easier to plan uh, around everyone using the same technology. Uh, Students have the same device every day. They can personalize it. It's consistent. Uh, they're used to the, the hardware that they have. Uh, we do gain some space, uh, not storing so many carts that we currently store now. Um, college and career prep is certainly enhanced as uh, when you head to college, you'll be using a, using a computer in pretty much every class, and the same goes for work. Uh, any company you start at typically will assign you a laptop or a desktop to sit in front of and work on. Uh, it would certainly help us meet requirements for upcoming state assessments, uh, avoiding having to cram people into labs or move mobile labs around and uh, try to make it work. It allows us to leverage funds available from the building project to uh, sort of kickstart this one-on-one -on -one program. And it uh, creates a sustainable model as we would be purchasing the same number of devices every year, basically purchasing devices for one class uh, each year to maintain that going forward. There would be some additional costs, obviously. We'd need to do uh, some professional development, uh, and teachers would have to update methodology a bit to be more in line with students having access to a device uh, all day. And some software and curriculum materials would certainly have to be updated. But that, again, uh, updating curriculum into electronic formats could actually be a cost savings going forward. <clears throat> so option C, uh, the any portable device option of BYOD, there are certainly some benefits to that. Um, they do have access throughout the day and after school, though some students did report uh, in surveys that they did not have internet access at home, so that access would be limited regardless of whether they have the device. And the same goes for a uh, district provided device as well. They do still have the same device each day and they can personalize it uh, and it does solve some of the storage and equipment materials um, issue as well. So we did a uh, survey of current LHS students to find out just what kind of portable devices everyone has. Uh, we got a, about 377 responses, give or take, on each question. Uh, to the paper survey that was distributed. The vast majority of students have an iPhone, which, which is pretty predictable, I think. Um, a little bit less than half have access to a Windows laptop. Um, again, small numbers on the iPads and Android tablets, which are probably the lower end of acceptable devices to use for instruction on a daily basis. Uh, I don't think an iPhone or an iPod or a different type of phone like that is really a, a viable device for instruction. I use my phone to work, but it's one-line emails, return text messages, things like that. I think these numbers are, um, they were impactful to me at least, uh, to see mm -hmm. the number of students that um, 
don't have access to a, a viable portable device. So that was, you asked if they had access, not if they had their own. Is that uh, correct? Did, it was worded as access to, yes. And were they able to um, say they had multiple if they filled it in? Cause yes. They Some students had circled many. three of okay, these things. Right. Yeah, Some okay. students Some circled uh, none. None. Okay. Right. Yes. And that might be another important way to go back, and we, we still have those surveys, but when we looked at these numbers, it, it dawned on me that we were seeing these trends where some students were reporting multiple devices it. and right. others, which we asked them to, but we didn't, uh, the, this data isn't reported that way, and it is an important right. statistic. Okay. Um, but there were uh, many that um, nothing was right. listed. Well. Uh, you know, only 20 that had actually zero listed, but it is 244 um, iPhones. I, I I agree. You know, I I wouldn't want to rely on that to uh, day in and day out to to really enhance my learning in the classroom. Well, you have 240-ish that have a iPad, a laptop, or a Chromebook. Mm -hmm. The other things that you're considering not acceptable. Right. So right. there's a large fraction of those kids that don't have access to acceptable technology. Right. Right. That, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like 50 yeah. percent. Yeah. Yeah. That, so those that. Yeah. Those numbers are quite telling. I agree. So some of the other disadvantages of bringing any portable device, uh, it's it would typically be students will not have equal access. Some students will have brand new laptops that their family purchased for them before the school year. Some students will have three or four year old or five year old devices that they're trying to use. Uh, certainly brings inequality into the picture. Uh, technical challenges, as I mentioned before, every student having a different type of, you know, eight or nine different types of devices in the classroom uh, sort of puts the teachers in the position of trying to do tech support uh, on many different operating systems that they aren't really fully versed in. Uh, it provides instructional challenges, um, supporting multiple platforms, trying to design curriculum uh, around different screen sizes, different operating systems, um, whether you have a keyboard, don't have a keyboard, things like that. Uh, <clears throat> another key point uh, in bring your own device, uh, supporting any portable device is that cell phones and many tablets and even some laptops can access these cellular networks. We have no control over those networks. We can't filter content. Um, it, it's a very difficult uh, problem to overcome. And I'm not even sure how it would impact the uh, Child Internet Protection Act if we had students accessing, doing actual school curriculum on devices that could get out to the, the internet unfiltered. Uh, and despite all that, the district would still be purchasing 112 devices uh, each year to fill in the gaps. We've identified, um, you know, with regard to professional development, is some target setting, not uh, necessarily around uh, specific topics, but really saying um, over the last several years, as there's become more reliability in the system, our professional development efforts um, have been there and have taken uh, uh, several forms um, this year. I think we'll see almost all of these things happen, maybe not at the number expressed here. Uh, but it's certainly a, a, an embedded model of professional development where we uh, would continue to provide stipended positions for faculty to serve as mentors or supports to other faculty members around the, the use of technology in the classrooms. Uh, we would uh, recommend that we set aside six instructional technology focused faculty meetings in each building annually. Uh, the principals uh, in the various buildings have done that already, uh, probably not at that a particular level, but we know if we're going to make the, uh, the kind of investment uh, to move to a one-on-one -on -one computing environment as well as continue to help uh, in, enhance our mobile card environment for students, uh, which is part of this proposal as well, um, that we want to make sure that the teachers are provided the opportunities for their professional development to, to, um, to 
really maximize the benefits of that. Uh, we would recommend that there are four instructional technology workshops um, every year. Those could be done in conjunction with professional development times or after school uh, for uh, PD, uh, PEs, for teachers for uh, recertification. And also uh, we would plan uh, on a regular basis every three years to offer a college level course with Lunenburg credit uh, that teachers could uh, access um, and uh, we, um, in proposing this every three years, we felt that uh, we'd make that opportunity available knowing that the advancements over that time, that that would be a time to really uh, be able to provide that support to uh, new best practices uh, rather than um, year after year offering um, that particular course that it, it made sense to, to put it in there in a three-year cycle. So that's what professional development would look like. And then we would, um, this would be our schedule for the curriculum uh, review and update of our instructional technology. Uh, we have a curriculum in pa place. Um, it's spotty uh, in some buildings where it gets implemented because you know we've had some reductions in terms of that model. Uh, this will begin to once again provide some opportunities for incorporating that curriculum into classrooms rather than have it be external uh, to the classroom. And we would start uh, with December uh, of um, of 2014 uh, to basically budget for a working group, a curriculum working group uh, for next year uh, to be stipended as we do our curriculum task forces, if you will, um, to uh, begin this work and have that take place over the course of the 2015-2016 school year with having a, a basically a final draft for the school committee in March of 2016 and then in May 2016 the financial support for the implementation should be finalized by that point in time. So we were sensitive towards the budgetary aspects of, of building that curriculum review and uh, first for the stipends for our personnel uh, who are doing the work in addition to their other educator responsibilities and then also for any kinds of needed uh, materials and or software that would uh, be required to, to support that. So that's what the instructional review looks like. Um, as we said, this is the first draft of um, a model, of a plan that the school committee can consider with the broader uh, community and we want to deepen this uh, discussion. Uh, there are lots of fine details in this. We tried to provide a high-level conceptual <coughs> model to begin with, um, but it needs to be refined and it needs to be de detailed in terms of uh, what direction we uh, might choose to move in. We would uh, also need at that time to identify possible cost savings. Uh, we just weren't able to get far enough into work to have that ready for tonight, but we'll continue those efforts as well because um, there's evidence that that information is uh, that that is out there that we can actualize that. We just need to do some additional research in terms of savings to apply against some of the additional expenditures. And we want to look at what would be required in terms of updates and additions to policy as we begin to look at a one-on-one -on -one environment in particular uh, for our students. And there are some great examples out there. Uh, as Mr. Maladrino said, um, it's not, uh, we're not, certainly not going to be the first uh, community to, to move in this direction, um, hopefully, for our students. Um, and then, of course, making sure that our uh, internet, both safety and instructional curriculum is, is in place uh, to make sure that we're preparing students uh, for when they get to that point where they're in the one-on-one -on -one environment, that they're ready to maximize their use of that tool that's uh, being provided. So thank you for your time tonight. And, um, and maybe our, our next step would be talk about doing a, a workshop uh, with an opportunity to do more in-depth conversation around this. Okay. Did we get that presentation um, in an electronic copy? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I think if, if we're gonna do a workshop on this, we should do it fairly soon, okay. January or February. Okay. Um, 
because you, that you, seems to be a good format for right. uh, mm -hmm. for broadening and deepening this conversation. Right. Okay, so maybe at our next meeting, if you bring your calendars, we'll see if we can find a day in January that works. And if January we can't do, we'll work on February. Yep. Okay. And I know we'd appreciate feedback in terms of is this getting at the information that you're interested in, in um, hearing about, um, putting together these various scenarios of what it would look like, um, how we would be utilizing the building um, funds. And, and remember, there's this allowance that's provided based upon every student in terms of what goes into the technology. And, and that allowance is $1,200 per student. And that addresses the infrastructure pieces as well. Uh, so the servers and all of those kinds of things come out of that allowance. Um, and that's why uh, we're very much mindful about, um, I, I mean, uh, number one, to do 6 through 12, there's not enough money in that budget to do the kind of infrastructure that's required and do a one-on-one -on -one environment for every student. But as we said before, um, uh, we also would set up a, a non-sustainable model if we were to utilize uh, building funds for that purpose. So we've thought about how this gets phased in and how it becomes manageable and enduring for the system. No, I think it's a good start. Do you guys have any thoughts, comments, feedback at the moment? Uh, just, you know, uh, first blush feedback. I'm, I'm glad that what we're going to kind of take a look at first is instructional curriculum so that we actually, you know, see how it's going to be, you know, you know where the rubber actually will be mm -hmm. the road with this so that when we go to you know, make a decision we actually know we have an idea of how this is going to be utilized and what you know what what the valued outcomes will be for that and I, I really appreciate that 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 the cart is before, before the horse in this case um, and um, just a comment I, you know as we talk about curriculum I, I'd also uh, ask that we, we We've talked about um, you know the use of it for CAD and for engineering and and so on and so forth. There there may be opportunities now that we have this uh, basically super highway of a, of an infrastructure in terms of the building, its ability to to maintain any number of of, of units that we also think about. Um, you know actual uh, you know technology education as uh, you know things like you know teaching coding and te mm -hmm. you know and you know students developed apps. Uh, as as part of you know the curriculum as we go forward because I think that's really where the where the real future for, for many of our students lie. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Now we'll move on to the uh, primary, middle school, and high school proposed budgets for next year. Excuse myself for a moment. Sure. Which way would you like to start? Okay, Ms. Blaisdell, you always get to be first. <laughs> Good evening. Superintendent Combs, Mr. Berthium, members of the school committee, Parent and community members, um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the FY16 primary school budget, budget. It's an extensive budget request, but one that our staff and I strongly feel is necessary to continue to move our students forward in the learning process. The budget was developed with care to target areas of need, not want. We used student data and identified areas of curriculum in need of strengthening to formulate our requests. I would first like to thank our staff at the primary school for their hard work and dedication to the children we serve. Our teachers are passionate about learning and their students' success. They work each and every day to help every child reach their full potential. Without these valuable human resources, we would not be able to make the educational progress necessary for our students. And all of the resources I would be talking about tonight would only be half as effective and useful. We are currently servicing 539 students at the primary school, preschool through third grade. 
And based on our current enrollment, we anticipate um, having 47 preschool students next year, 115 kindergarten students next year, 11, um, 111 first grade students, 127 second grade students, and 121 third grade students. So that's the population that we're looking at that would be serviced by this, um, um, the, bu the budget proposal tonight. Um, I'm gonna start with talking a little bit about the personnel that we're looking at um, needing uh, in moving um, into next year. Uh, for personnel, we are requesting five paraprofessionals to meet the needs of individual students' needs as well as um, assistance on the grade levels. We are concerned um, at this current time about those numbers um, that we currently have in our first grade classrooms. Um, and if they were to reach 130 um, students, we would need to consider other options relative to our personnel needs. Um, and we are currently at this time exploring those options if that should ever um, meet, meet that critical mark. Uh, we are recommending um, also an increase in five professional, um, paraprofessional hours. Um, if we could increase five paraprofessional hours, um, we would like to use that to uh, provide before school tutoring for our students identified through the tiered intervention process. Um, we would run four eight-week sessions with progress monitoring, targeting areas of identified needs for our students. Um, the total non-personnel requests, and I do have to apologize to the committee at this time, when I was going through my final check, there was a number um, that was left out of the um, front page. Um, so the number that I'm gonna share with you as far as what I'm proposing for the non-personnel budget is um, slightly upticked <laughs> from where, um, from the number I had given you. Um, so if you just um, check that, I can help you try to um, straighten your numbers out on, your, on the sheets that you have in front of you. The total non-personnel requested budget is $73,410. This represents a 55% increase over the FY15 budget. And I'm not gonna talk about every single line item, but I'm gonna talk about the major hitters and the major changes, anything over $1,000 in a line kind of thing, okay? So the um, biggest, one of the biggest changes, um, um, uh, or most of the major changes that, um, that this budget represents um, our requests that are designed to improve the curriculum in the areas of reading and math. We are requesting approximately $15,000 in reading supplies designed to update the reading resources connected to the Common Core. An additional $5,900 are requested in the area of workbooks to update the everyday math materials and to provide the handwriting without tears workbooks at the um, grades K through two grade level. If you remember the handwriting without tears workbooks were cut from last year's budget and we're looking to try to get those back in um, this coming year's budget. Uh, we are requesting an increase in our math supplies by $3,500 to update our everyday math teaching materials. Um, they've come out with um, materials that um, are supported through um, web-based um, opportunities for not only our teachers, but our, our, our students and our parents to be able to access those materials online um, um, through their website. Um, the materials that we priced out would come with a five-year um, subscription um, to those, um, ac that website access. Um, the line that was left out was the audio-visual line. Um, it was increased by $3,700. This represents, you know, walkie-talkies for um, continuing to improve our um, communication within the building, as well as for safety um, reasons. Software for the iPads to connect with the curriculum and um, rechargeable batteries. We are also requesting $1,000 to purchase books for the library to update resources in the library and to have resources available to students that align more readily with the Common Core. 
Um, there is re uh, request to increase the general school, su school supply line. Um, this is papers and classroom supply materials um, used for instruction. The guidance line is increased by um, $1,300, and this is actually to pull the target presentation that it, at this current time is um, supported through um, gifts and um, P PTO gift funding, um, that type of thing, and pull that into the budget because it's become a very integral part of our um, GEMS curriculum and our guidance um, curriculum and is incorporated um, closely and tied closely to those, those areas as well as our anti-bullying um, efforts. And last, we are requesting a set of classroom student desks to replace some of the desks moved to the primary school from the TC Passio Elementary School. Um, several sets of desks came over with the third grade, um, and we took the best of what um, TC Passios had, but um, we would need to start thinking about replacing those. So that's a little summary of the budget. Um, I certainly would be willing to answer any questions that you might have um, relative to any line items. Uh, Ms. Blaisdell, can you rem remind us uh, what you requested last year? I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Maybe you don't, and that's a fine answer, but I know you requested a sum that we were not able to provide, and we had to cut your budget by a substantial amount. Right. I think it was probably close to this. I think, if I remember correctly, it was in the $60,000 range. So we must be burning through any backlog of stuff we had hanging around. Is that accurate? Extra oh, workbooks yes. are long, <laughs> long gone. Oh yes. If um, last year and the year before, um, the assistant principal and I were in found in many closets looking for extra math books to pull out so that we would only order the number that we absolutely needed. So that's I mean we're we've we're draining our resources of any kind of things that we can find in backs of closets. Right. Are there any questions for Ms. Blaisdell? Comments? Feedback? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Santry. Mr. Santry is up out of the seat, ready to go. <laughs> So good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here to talk about our budget. I assume that you have a copy of the uh, requested budget for FY16. I think it comes in at about $45,515. Uh, that's approximately $13,000 more than we had for um, uh, what was our final budget in FY15. So uh, with the committee's permission, I'd just like to review the lines that had a substantial increase. I have six items in my budget uh, that represent 94% of the increase over last year. Is that okay? So our first one is our textbook line. Last year, we had to reduce that to zero. And uh, this year, I want to reinstate that money in order to uh, complete a set of astronomy books for the sixth grade that we have been purchasing over the last couple of years, and that's an amount of uh, $1,620. Uh, there's also a $2,600 increase in art supplies, and if you see over the past few years, we have had to reduce that budget, and those are consumables, so as Dr. Berthium pointed out, that we're running out of those uh, extra materials that we've had in order to get by in the past, so I'm asking for uh, that amount of money in order to re plenish the supply that we've had in the past. Our ELA, uh, ELA line went up to $1,800, but this is for four grade levels for purchasing and replacing novels and non-fictional texts that align to the Common Core. We have a $1,000 increase in our social studies line that was cut last year, and our social studies teachers are requesting a replacement and updating of maps in their classrooms. And then our biggest budget driver is our library line, which has been cut year after year. Uh, so I'm trying to reinstate some money uh, for that line for the purchase of new books for the library. Uh, last year, the average age of the library book was about 17 years at Turkey Hill Middle School. So, uh, and I'm also asking for an increase of $1,500 in our general school supplies account. So those six lines represent about a 94% uh, increase over, the, over last year's budget. 
Uh, Mr. Sandra, I'd just like to point out to our audience who can't see this sheet that even though you asked for textbook money this year, we haven't bought a textbook for the middle school since FY13. Yes, it's true. That's two years of no expenditures in that line at all. Are there questions, comments? I'm just wondering, with regard to the library, um, does she take money from Scholastic or any of the books off of Scholastic to put She stock? does. She, she uses does. money to compensate for that. For okay. the book fair, money goes yeah. directly back into the library. Okay. But this would be a separate line okay. item for money that goes into library books. Other questions or thoughts? Great. Okay. Thank you. I'd also like to uh, make a couple recommendations. Sure. I was able to meet my school advisory council last Tuesday, the 25th. We had some really good conversations. So if I'm, I wanna make some recommendations around personnel for next year. So we were looking at those larger groups of grade level um, enrollment numbers. So I know Ms. Blaisdell in the third grade right now has a class of 132. And in our fifth grade, we have a class of 134. So with five classroom teachers per grade level, that puts our numbers at about 27. So if that's not accounting for any other move-ins or uh, additional uh, students in those areas. So, you know, that 27, 28 per classroom, we're pushing the cusp of uh, manageable class size. So what we're seeing is that we have uh, diverse learners in our classes. We have high-end achievers, but we also have reluctant learners. And in order to better meet those needs, I'm recommending that we add two additional classroom teachers in that area for grade four and for grade six in August of 2015. That would bring those class sizes down to about 21 to 22. So we were having great conversations that if we feel true differentiation is gonna happen for all students in the classroom, not just for our low-end learners or our struggling learners, but also for our high achievers. We need to put teachers in a position where they can have manageable class sizes. So uh, that's the recommendation that our school advisory council is gonna make, is to add two additional classroom teachers to our roster for next year. Questions, comments? Do we have two classrooms? That's a great question, yes. Um, I would be able to accommodate those and still be able to uh, have uh, grade specific special education classrooms. Uh, the plan I had in my head is that we would, um, not in my head, a plan that I discussed with school advisory is that we would probably take uh, the computer lab offline because that was a classroom in the past and that we would uh, try to purchase a mobile lab uh, of netbooks so we could push those into the classroom. And then uh, we also have an OTPT classroom that we would be able to open up for uh, an additional classroom. Um, we would do a little bit of switching. It would be upstairs, downstairs situation, but then we could put that group into our, uh, our health room down that's uh, adjacent to the gymnasium. So we'd have to do a little bit of shifting, but it's definitely manageable. Other thoughts, questions? Thank you. Any, would you like to? Paraprofessional. Paraprofessionals, I would love in order to have two full-time paraprofessionals per grade level in order to help meet the needs of the students also. So that would be my recommendation too. So we, how, how, many that was, how many more? What's the end? Grade six and grade seven have two paraprofessionals per grade level now. Grades four and grades five have 1.5, so we split one. So it would be the addition of one full okay. full-time employee. Anything else? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Santry. Uh, at one point in time, we had discussed extended learning time. We did. Um, I think it was about four years ago that we had an extended learning program at Turkey Hill where we uh, provided students the, abil uh, the ability to stay after school for a 40 to 50 minute period and work with grade level tutors um, on whether they were struggling with a task or they wanted to get their homework started or if they were gonna do a project-based learning issue, they would have uh, the classroom tutor that was in there for the instruction being able to give them that instruction after school. It was a very successful program that we had and it ran about three times a week. 
um, for about 40 to 50 minutes. So I would love to reinstate that. What comes with that is the discussions that we had in our school advisory is that means the, the addition of an early or a late bus in which we would have to work out either uh, them coming in on the high school bus in the morning or shipping them back down to the primary school in the afternoon. So that gives us a very finite window of time, which uh, it equates in the afternoon to I think we worked out 30 minutes and in the morning we could have a, a, a little bit more of time. I think we worked out 40 Minutes closer to 40 yeah in the morning that would mean they'd be dropping off at the they would be dropping off at turkey hill around 7 15. okay anything else no thank you you're welcome and mr spadafino lhs good evening um Mr. Malandrinos was talking a little while ago, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, bring up, he talked about the work orders and they've been down 25% and all that. And it is so true. The work that they do is phenomenal. And I just wanted to, I know we have one of the members of his staff is leaving us uh, on Friday. He has a, has a new job and is moving. A great opportunity for him. Um, and that's Alex Smith, he's a technician. But um, between the work that Steve Melandrinos has done and Josh Branham has done, um, he's the network administrator. I, I may not have the titles correct, but um, they've been phenomenal. And I just wanted to acknowledge Alex before publicly before um, he leaves on Friday. So he's done a wonderful job. And the district will miss him. Um, <clears throat> I know there was probably some, some sticker shock here uh, looking at the, the final requested uh, budget for um, 2016. Um, and that total budget is $197,398. Um, and that's a, a $62,000, roughly $62,500 uh, increase over um, last year's uh, budget or this current year's budget. Um, but I just wanted to go through some of those, those items um, because it, it helps paint that picture of why we're asking for what we're asking for and where it's coming from. Um, and I look at it, everything over about a $1,500 increase. The first one is advisorships, um, and that's a $2,000 increase, and that's to close the gap that we have right now with student activities. And we talked a little bit about in, in the spring, I don't know if you remember, but uh, there was a, there was a, a gap that we're, we're looking at. We have to make a decision at some point whether we raise activity fees uh, to cover that and to be able to, um, to pay the advisors of clubs and activities. Um, we either have to do that uh, we have to put it into the budget to cover, or we need to cut some of those offerings that we're offering students now after school, um, because we're we're seeing more interest now, uh, and more clubs are being created because kids have interest in getting like minds together and doing something that they enjoy after school. So that's where that two thousand dollars comes from. Um, there's a professional development uh, we have in there. I have in there for. Uh, $7,435 increase, and that is uh, included in that is $4,000 for AP and pre-AP training uh, for English, um, and those are having new teachers trained, and then uh, um, Calculus BC, and that could be a new, new course offering that we offer in addition to the AB that we currently have, um, but we see, a, a, we see that there is a, a need and, um, and hopefully a, a want for that, uh, so we're looking into that. Um, then there's a, a $5,500 increase to develop the advisory program at the high school, and this is something that we've talked about for some time. And I know um, we, and to do that, um, including that as a consultant fees, um, text and materials that are part of that. And then when you talk about uh, uh, personnel, you know, we need, in order to compensate teachers' time, because uh, we couldn't do it monetarily uh, during that school day, um, but to compensate their time, because currently it's a homeroom period. So if we made it more of an instructional period and gave them a, a planning period, uh, that would be taking away their study hall duty right now and having a paraprofessional run those study halls. So that would be one paraprofessional uh, to do that, um, to give all our teachers planning time in order to uh, deliver that curriculum during their um, advisory period. Uh, library books, um, there's a $3,000 increase in this line. 
And that's the same $11,000 that request, was requested last year, and then we cut that um, down to 8,000. And then that, that money would be used for our nonfiction selections, um, which is essential to meet the Common Core state standards and to, to increase our young adult fiction books that we have. Um, special education was $2,765 increase. And the reason that that is there is last year, that was kind of a, a miss in our budget. Uh, there was some miscommunication between the teachers and especially the specialists. Uh, we had the new special ed director online and some teacher, teachers didn't know where it was in our budget. If it was going through the high school, which it had done the previous year, or if it was through special services where it had been in the past. Um, so it kind of got dropped. <laughs> um, so that's where that almost that entire increase in that line um, is because of that. Uh, physical education, uh, there's a $2,372 uh, $2, increase, and 1,800 of that is uh, to replace soccer goals that are owned by youth soccer. And once they started playing and practicing off site, because they no longer use the high school fields, they took their goals um, with them. So it would be replacing those goals that they uh, currently have used. In addition to that, there are increases for uh, some of the weight room equipment, kettlebells, BOSU trainers, and equipment for uh, games um, and gym. Uh, guidance, there was a $2,100 increase, and you know, uh, in that is uh, $1,500 uh, for the cost of a Naviance curriculum, which provides access to school counseling curriculum for all students, and a $600 for uh, virtual high school fees. So now, for any student who takes an AP class, it's going to be $75 um, to take that AP class. And anybody who takes a lab science, in addition, it's $75. So this would be putting that into the budget, or else it's going to have to, students are going to have to pay that when they sign up for those courses. And then the big, the big <coughs> items are around textbooks, where there's a, a, a $47,506 increase. Um, and in that is $34,632 in social studies texts. And that breakdown is $24,000 for new world history textbooks. And they have, and it comes with a seven year uh, e-license, e-access license. Um, and those books are used in grades eight and nine. That's where the, the world history curriculum is eight and nine. And they would replace the 1999 edition that we're currently using. Um, and then there's $10,000 in AP textbooks um, for uh, history as well, uh, six year, uh, and it comes with a six year e-license, and that replaces the 2006 edition, and we're required to replace those every 10 years by uh, College Board. In addition, that, that new AP course that we were talking about, the new AP Calculus BC, um, there would be $3,500 that we would need for uh, calculus books um, to help with that offering. And then there was $11,382 to replace the 2003 edition of the Spanish One textbooks. So overall, um, that's a $62,513 increase over what has been budgeted for uh, this year. And a large um, number from there is from our textbooks that we're looking for. Um, so if you take the textbooks out, uh, we're roughly at the same point that we were requesting last year. So questions? Other staffing changes that you'd like to see? Um, I, this was something I wasn't prepared for necessarily. I, I would, I would hope for the world. I would love an, <laughs> uh, another English teacher because um, we did lose an English teacher and replaced with part time. So we have somebody swinging back and forth between history and English. So I think a history, t an English teacher would be ideal. But other than that, I think we have sufficient staff outside of the prior professionals that we're looking at for the ad advisory. Yeah. Yep. Anything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, at our next meeting, the superintendent will put together her recommended budget, putting together all the things we've been hearing about for the past, I don't know, month and a half. Uh -huh. And um, that will be the basis for our budget hearing, which will be coming up in uh, January, I think, right? I, 
I don't know that we set it for January, Dr. Berthiam. We did it later uh, We had last started year. Uh, moving it later, and I you know with um, you know the change in um, leadership, the governor's office, that yep. yeah, House One point. doesn't come out until March fourth is when it's supposed to come out. So okay, so we'll do um, it after that. Then. Uh, yeah, I I think we'll have more understanding Clarity. of of what's known right. at that point in time. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have uh, next item is a resolution regarding Energy Star purchasing. I'm guessing Mr. Londa's here to talk about that. Well, I no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't why know. I is think that, that why you're here, Mr. Londa? <laughs> 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 no. He looks pretty happy. Um, right actually, <laughs> I, he doesn't want to get up. He's just listening. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that uh, resolution was the appropriate word to put there. Um, what I basically wanted to let the uh, the school committee know is as we've been working with the new building project and, and getting our chips points, if you will, to make sure that we're building sustainable there, uh, you know, we brought several policies forward to you. And um, there's another one around Energy Star, purchasing any Energy Star equipment uh, whenever pro possible that needs to be documented. That was our, our procedure. But as Mr. Londa and I continue to work with this, uh, you know, we felt it a nice opportunity, and this will come to the um, the policy subcommittee next Tuesday when we meet um, is really putting together a policy that talks about our commitment to sustainability um, and uh, green operation. And um, so that's uh, just a heads up around uh, a, a policy that we intend to uh, first present to the subcommittee um, and then end up in a first reading and on uh, to hopefully adoption um, as we have had this now nice opportunity to really look at our policies in a very holistic fashion around uh, all the things that we're currently doing and some additional things that we are, are putting in place to make sure that uh, they don't um, leave um, based upon the personnel that are in the positions that uh, we formalize that we've codified that and um, it will be something that continues um, into the future because some very fine work has been done certainly with Mr. Londa's leadership as well as across the town in some of the efforts around the green communities and and we felt it was the appropriate time uh, to bring that forward. Initially I had looked at a resolution to do it and then we said no we really feel like uh, putting this in policy is the route to go so no action required on that. Okay great that's easy. Okay, on our school committee goals. Unfortunately, I forgot to print them out. Is that something you can? I can pull up that. And bring them with me. So we did have a workshop, and I've forgotten the date, but it was, uh, let's see, November 17th. I have them. I'm gonna look at oh, is that what I said? Okay. The updated ones? I think yeah, so. Great. Excellent. Uh, and we did propose, we came up with some draft goals that I ha took the action to put into words and send around to you guys. Did you? Is there any feedback? This is our opportunity to talk about. Did I capture what you guys were looking for? Yeah, I thought. Okay, and the, the goals have been up on the website for a couple of weeks anyway now. And mm -hmm. has there been any feedback? We have not. Regarding the school committee goals? Okay, then uh, I'm not going to read through these. Anybody who's interested can go look on the website and see what they are. But is there a motion to um, accept these goals for, they're actually two year goals? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Any discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We have goals. We're up to public comment. Is there any public comment from the board? Or from the remaining public? Aye. Sure. Come on up. Um, Phyllis Luck, 50 Sunset Lane. <laughs> yeah. um, when we, you were talking about uh, the options for buying the laptops for the kids and you said every year you'd have to build to buy a new set for the incoming 10th grade what happens to the set that the seniors used that's what I have as a question for our work <laughs> with the first two years of purchases from the building center uh, building oh you said 10 11 and 12 would right. have 
computers. So right. that, that every the, after that, the life have. of those is um, typically three years is what has been proposed in terms of the the sustainable life um, on those. So those would either be repurposed, any that are um, ready to be repurposed into laptop carts throughout the district or uh, basically uh, returned or recycled. Oh, okay. Or, you know, there could be, I suppose, the option of uh, making them available to sell, for yep. sale uh, to the students. I know some districts have done that. Oh, yeah, so then you can get, you. You get yep. some money back for that. Right, yeah. right. It's, it's basically a replacement program to do one grade level per year so that every three years we're not having to replace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I kind of got that, but I'm going, okay, there's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the whole class is graduating. There's but of course, the, that first year, by using the uh, the building funds to do the, the 11th and 12th grade, uh, basically you'd want to repurpose those all immediately. For reuse by the For students. For reuse. Yeah. Right. So basically, you understand what you're saying? Yeah, the seniors, once the seniors graduate, those then will be, tent, if you will, we'll passed down. down. Right, so we're going to jump into the new building with three grades all getting brand new computers. Right? Oh, okay. So, so, then, the so seniors, then the first year. They're brand new. They're we'll very go, new. So they'll go to the 10th graders the next year. They'll go and to other applications within the district. Other right? applications, yeah. Right. Not to the 10th graders. Right. The 10th graders that next year will get new devices. Oh, okay. So, but even though those have two years left in them? They'll, they'll get used elsewhere, elsewhere in the district. Right. Not to the 10th grade. Right. So. They'll replace other things in the district. But this is so Maybe that we, we get on a schedule. So you Every have, year. Right. right. Because if we hold right. off until everything's three years old. And yeah, it, right. And, all this, right. and at that, know, that, So it starts us right away. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I yeah. get that. At, right. a, so at that point, there's discarded. several carts that we've purchased that are in service right now that will be at the end of their useful lives. Not the carts themselves, but the, lap the, laptop. and the laptops mm -hmm. that are on them. And, and those, those are prime subspects for these uh, being replaced by those 10th and 11th graders. So grade, would those or go to like and, the 8th and 9th graders? We'd be using those cards. It, that could be an option, but it really looks more now like replacing the ones on the carts that we've purchased these last couple years that will now be reaching. But uh, I mean, like 10th and 11th and 12th graders won't have to use them, right? Because they'll already. No, no, the, the, they'll but the cards could be used at the at the, primary at the school. 6, right, 7, right, 8. Right, right, right. The, the middle school. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the carts and the um, labs, are they, how often, are they, how is that organized now? How, you know, how do you sign up and is it, are they fully utilized or? They are. Um, they are all fully utilized, particularly the, uh, the mobile carts. Um, we can't, um, we can't, we don't have enough to keep everybody uh, in use with the number of carts that we have. The requests far outweigh uh, the, uh, the supply that we have. The okay. teachers do yeah. sign up, and from what I understand, those carts are Pretty used nice. every period of Every period, day. every day. Uh, yeah. There's no break. Oh, that's great. So then the, the teachers would use them more if there were more mm -hmm. cards available. So then the, the teachers are pretty well equipped to move in, into this when 10th, 11th, and 12th grades have them. They are. The, they the, are. The teachers are going to be ready and to that's, use them. And that's why that made so much sense is the whole logistics of having to care for the carts and having um, to distribute them and having to, you know, try to get them all right now. Our infrastructure at the high school, while it's, it's a decent wireless, it's not robust enough that everybody can jump online at the same time so you have to phase them in five at a time in terms of loading them up so um, that's why uh, when when we saw the numbers around this it made sense to really target the 10th 11th and 12th graders who uh, would have had the early experiences through the curriculum in terms of using and learning how to use utilize this tool um, and then as uh, the most senior students in the school uh, really making that part of the tools that we give them and for them to manage and for them to be responsible around. I've got another question. Um, how much of an inventory will you have when you have, when every kid in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade has one, they're not all going to work all the time. So how big of an inventory will you have for loaners in addition, do you think? 
You know, I, I can't say how big of an inventory because some of those reuse ones will certainly be what we're looking at, um, you know, from the 10th, uh, that first year, the 10th the 11th, first graduating the, gra class. those would be some of the, for building that inventory. Uh, we'll, we'll have some level of inventory. Um, I don't know that um, we have nailed down that number from other districts that say this is what you should expect to keep on hand, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't that, know that's if that's very 10 percent. Um, right. the, yeah, the more staff you have, the faster things will come back online. So right. the fewer right. pieces of equipment you need. So you have I don't to see. That yeah, I don't way. see that as being um, an excessive <laughs> number and manageable within that initial purchase for us. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. Any other public comment? Looks like not. All right, reports. I do not have a FinCom report. School Council reports. Um, Turkey Hill met last week, as Mr. Santry said. We yeah, actually had a tour of the um, oh the building of the building site. That was really exciting, um, and we were promised another one in May once the steel is up, so we can see what the building looks like, and then we discussed the budget. Okay. We had one this afternoon. Oh, wow. Um, the Tiger program will be there next Wednesday, the 10th, at the primary school. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to do two sessions. The, the school will be split into two sessions, and then they're going to do workshops in the classrooms. Um, she talked about the budget, and um, they did um, bring up the numbers of the classroom size. And one of the other mothers on the school council had brought up the fact that she heard some people talking about the large class sizes and looking into school choicing out of the district unless we made plans to work on school class sizes. So we also talked about our, I don't even know how to say it, but the head lice policy. Oh. Ridiculous. I don't know the term, <laughs> the real word for it is, you know, the diagnosis. I don't know either. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Um, so we're working on that okay. to address some parental concerns. Okay. Great. Uh, PTO update? Um, yeah, we have a meeting on Monday. Okay. Um, but I wanted to tell you about the Barnes & Noble Book Fair. It was um, a huge hit. I don't have the exact numbers, but we had guest readers, Mr. Shaysgreen, Mr. Quartermarsh, Mr. Sparks, Miss Murray, Mr. Adams, and Mrs. Scott. Um, Colleen was there. It was it great. Was, there was a huge turnout. That's excellent. Yeah, it was excellent. Um, the Square One art number is in, and they raised five thousand four hundred forty-four dollars and eighty-eight cents. Wow! In that fundraiser, yeah, it was that was a big hit too. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and the, and everything is in already, so it's ready for Christmas. Super. Yeah. Okay. So the next meeting is Monday. Great. We don't have a conflict, right? Not that I know. No. no. Okay, hey, policy is meeting on Tuesday at 7 o'clock, I think. Did we choose a time, or did I just make up a time? I thought it was 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30 in room 13 at TCP, so we'll do some more policy work. <clears throat> That's Tuesday, though, right? Tuesday, yep. Tuesday. Capital planning? Uh, we had a meeting yesterday, um, and we have another meeting on Tuesday to discuss now prioritizing all <coughs> the funding. Um, I did have a question in regard to TC, no, Turkey Hill, and it, I don't know if that's something I should ask now or just at another time, Superintendent, what do you think? Whatever you like. It's, the, it's regarding asbestos abatement, and if that is something that has to be done for the MSBA to consider giving us funding at a later date to do any updates or... No, the MSBA just doesn't pay yeah. for asbestos. Um, right, okay. right. So, yeah. That is just something that I wanted to... And make. to do the work in the building, if you did a, a reno of expansion, right. you'd have to take care of that. Prior to the... Prior reno. to it. And and the information. And, um, and the MSBA doesn't provide for it because they okay. expect that communities yes. will take care of it. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. In fact, in the, in the new building project, the demolition of the high school... Right. The asbestos abatement is not paid for by the MSBA. We are paying. For Correct. That. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's not cheap. We're on the hook for it, no matter yeah, how you look at it. Yeah, I just wanted, to, I just wanted yeah. to make sure I had clarity. Yeah. Yep. 
And, and, you know, this is where some of the discussion came in in terms of any of the upgrades around um, anything that has to happen in those ceilings over at Turkey. It just can't be done until that asbestos right. is abated. Uh, so um, the, the phone system, the intercom right. system, all of those kinds of things are connected to that asbestos abatement. Plus, there has to be an ongoing abatement process okay. being implemented. Yeah, it's ugly. I wish it wasn't there. Yeah, it is. Okay, wellness advisory? Um, has a meeting next Wednesday at 3.45 in the Turkey Hill Library. Great. Uh, PAXA? Um, next meeting is December 12th um, in room 13 at TCP at 11 a.m. Okay. The building reuse committee? Uh, there was a meeting on Monday. I was una uh, unable to attend. Okay. And calendar advisory, we heard your update, and you must have another meeting scheduled. Yes. Our next meeting is January 8th at 7.15 in room 13 at TCP, and we'll start discussing the start and end times. Part two. Yes, yes part two. That'll be exciting. Stay tuned. Okay, any other reports that we missed? No. Okay, then we do have need for an executive session in uh, accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 39, Section 23B, Paragraph 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collecti collective bargaining, um, and the negotiations will be with non-union personnel. Is there a motion to go into his executive session? Not to return. Not to return? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's a roll call vote. Ms. Roca? Aye. Aye. Oh. You're not assistant. Yeah, well, okay. Aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. Have a good night. I must be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I must be reading.